So a bit about me, uh, my name is Ash Narkar. I am a software engineer at Stira, and I'm a core contributor to the Open Policy Agent Project. And so today, we are going to make it easy to enforce fine grain authorizations in your system. So let's get started. So in this talk, I'm going to cover a bit about OPA's community, talk about its features, its use cases, uh, integrations, and then we'll go deep into a Kubernetes admission control demo. So the project was started in 2016 at Styra, and the goal of the project has been to unify policy enforcement across the stack. One of the earliest adopters of OPA was Netflix, and they use OPA for API authorization of their HTTP and gRPC APIs. Another company like Medallia uses OPA for risk management in Terraform. Chef, it uses OPA for API auditing as well as for API authorization. And so there are more than 20 companies right now who are using OPA in production for a number of use cases from admission control, authorization, RBAC, ABAC, data filtering, data protection, and so on. And so a bit about OPA itself, OPA is a CNCF project, and it was recently promoted to the incubating stage at the CNCF. We have around 59 contributors on Git, and we have a healthy Slack community of more than 800 members. And so just to give you some context about this, at the beginning of the year, we had around 400 members on Slack, and so it's great to see the growth of OPA, it's great to see people are liking OPA, and which is evident by the fact we have more than 2,000 stars on GitHub for the project. OPA is integrated with more than 20 plus open source projects out there, including some CNCF projects, and we always keep on adding more integrations. So this was a bit about OPA's community. Now let's see what OPA actually is. So what is OPA? OPA is an open source general purpose policy engine. It stands for the Open Policy Agent. When you use OPA, you are decoupling policy enforcement from decision making. So your services, they can offload policy decisions to OPA and by executing some queries. So let's try to understand this using a figure. Now, imagine you have a service, and this can be any service. It can be like your Kubernetes API server, this can be your own custom service, it can be an API gateway, anything. So whenever your service gets a request, your service will ask OPA whether this request is allowed or not by executing a query. And so this query can contain like the request method or the request path, the user making the request, basically any JSON value. And so what OPA will do, it is going to evaluate this query based on the policy and the data it has access to, create a decision and return it back to your service where it gets enforced. And so this decision can again be like a boolean, like an allow or deny, true or false, or any other JSON value. So you can see that we are trying to decouple the policy decision making from the policy enforcement itself, because OPA returns a decision which gets enforced by your service. And so it does not matter if you are doing like Kafka or if you are doing HTTP APIs, if you are doing SSH, as long as you give OPA some kind of structured or JSON data and you write policies which make sense for that data, OPA is going to give you a decision back. And so that is why we say OPA is a general purpose policy engine. So let's look at some of OPA's features. At the core of OPA is a high-level declarative language called as Rego. And what Rego does, it allows you to answer questions such as, can user X do operation Y on resource Z? Or what records is a user allowed to see? So with Rego, you not only get decisions that are Boolean, like true or false, yes or no, allow or deny, but you can also get decisions which are collections of values. OPA is written in Go, and you can embed it as a library, you can deploy it as a sidecar or a host level daemon. It's designed to be as lightweight as possible, so all the policies and all the data it needs for evaluation is stored in memory. So you can think of OPA as a host level cache for your policy decisions. 
your OPA and your service run on the same machine and this is done so that you get low latency on the request path as well as high availability. So once OPA is deployed, it has no runtime dependencies. It does not need to talk to any external service or it does not need to talk to any external database to make a decision. You can however extend OPA so that it talks to an external server to fetch policy and data, but that's completely optional. Speaking of which, OPA does provide a few management APIs. For example, the bundle API, which it uses to fetch policy and data from a remote service. It also has a status API, which allows you to upload status about OPA itself and the bundles it may have downloaded to a remote server. And it also has a decision log API, which allows you to upload decision logs to your remote service. So these decision logs can be stuff like the, the query that was uh, asked for, the input to that query, the decision that was made, and so on. So it does provide you with these APIs from which you can implement your own control plane. So uh, along with the core policy engine itself, OPA provides a rich set of tooling, which allows you to test, debug, and build your policies. So we have like a unit test framework, which you can use to test your policy so they are, they are confident about what you're writing is correct. We also have a tracing functionality, which allows you to see the steps which are involved in the policy evaluation. And we also have uh, integrations with editors like Vim and VS Code so that you can uh, author your policies. So some of the features of OPA, a high level declarative language, multiple deployment models, management APIs, and a rich tooling set. So like I mentioned before, OPA is integrated with a bunch of open source projects out there, and these are some of them. And so one of the hottest use cases for OPA right now is admission control in Kubernetes, using which you can deploy, you can have policies like don't allow images to be pulled, pulled from external uh, repositories. And we'll go in detail about this specific use case later. You can also integrate OPA with Terraform to test the changes Terraform is about to make before it actually makes them. So like a unit test for Terraform. With OPA and Docker, you can have uh, users, you can prevent users from running insecure containers. OPA is also integrated with a bunch of service mesh projects like your Envoys, your Istios for API authorization. With OPA and Linux Spam, you can have fine grain authorization over SSH and sudo. OPA is also integrated with Ceph, in which you can use uh, OPA to protect the data which is stored in your Ceph object storage. In the Kafka use case, there are some topics in Kafka which have high fan out, and you want to prevent corrupt data from being written on those topics because it will be read by many consumers. So you can have OPA authorize which users can actually write to such high fan out topics. One of the newer use cases for OPA is around data filtering. So this is a bit different because instead of OPA returning to you a decision like an allow or a deny, OPA returns to you a bunch of conditions which you can then convert to a SQL or an Elasticsearch query and then enforce them on the database. So these are some of OPA's integrations. And the cool thing here is that you can take any of this integration and start using OPA today to enforce custom policies without having to write a single line of code. So, how does OPA actually work? So we've seen this figure before. Whenever your service gets a request, your service asks OPA for a decision. OPA, based on the policies and the data it has access to, provides the decision back to your service where it gets enforced. Now, so for example, let's say you have a salary service. And the salary service provides information about the salaries of employees. And the policy which you want to enforce in English says that employees can read their own salary and the salary of anyone they manage. So this is the policy you want to enforce in OPA. And so when your service talks to OPA, it provides some kind of input to OPA, like the method, the request path, and the authenticated user who's making that request. 
Okay, so now we have this policy, and now we want to get started with OPA, we want to write some rego, right? So to help you with that, I am going to give you the three steps to get started with OPA to write rego. I call it the three steps to OPA. Step number one is clone the OPA repo. All you have to do is go to GitHub, clone open policy agent slash OPA, and that's it. That's a pretty simple step. So clone the OPA repo. Step two, you build the OPA binary. So once you clone the repo, just do like a make or a go build in your directory, and that will generate a beautiful OPA binary for you. And step three, once you've cloned the repo, you built your binary, now you simply execute that binary. And once you run this binary, you are gonna get an interactive shell which you can use to write queries and which you can use to write rego. So with these three simple steps, you can get started with OPA today and write some rego policies. It's that easy. Okay, so can we do better? You know, so this was good, right? These three steps are okay. You can use three steps. But can you do better to, info to get started with OPA and writing rego? And the answer is yes. So very recently, we released a rego playground. And the rego playground is this awesome online playground which you can use to experiment with rego policies and to get started with OPA. And so if you go to play.openpolicyagent.org, you can start using the rego playground right now and start writing rego policies. So this is what the playground looks like. Okay, so one of the first things you'll see with the playground is that, uh, so one of the first things you'll see with the playground is that you get syntax highlighting for rego code, which helps you to write your rego code much easily as well as debug your code much easily. Thanks. And so, uh, you want the mic? You're good? I can, yeah. I'm audible, right? right. Okay, yeah. cool. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so you've seen the syntax highlighting to write rego code, and it's play.openpolicyagent.org. And so the policy we were writing said that a user can read his own salary, and managers can read the salary of the users they manage. And so the way you read this policy is that allow is true if input.method is get, input dot, and input.path is salary employee ID, and input.user is employee ID. And so the cool thing about this policy is that the employee ID variable on line seven and line eight gets bound to a value from the input. And so the way you provide an input to this policy is simply by clicking on the input button. So in this case, I have a method which is get, I have a path which is salary Bob, and I have a user which is Bob. So I'm asking a question, is Bob allowed to see his own salary? And so the output which I expect is to be true. So allow is true because Bob is allowed to see his own salary, which is what we wanted our policy to do. So what happened here is on line seven and line eight, the employee ID got replaced by the value Bob from the input and therefore all these statements were true and your allow rule evaluated to true. So now let's say that Alice is curious about Bob's salary and she wants to see Bob's salary. So let's say the user Alice wants to see Bob's salary. So the question I'm asking is, can Alice see Bob's salary? And allow says false because we do not want Alice to see Bob's salary, which is, what, which, is, which is what we wanted our policy to do. So this was the first part of our policy which says that Bob or a user can see his own salary. So now let's imagine that Alice gets promoted and she becomes Bob's manager, right? 
And so now a policy says that a manager should be able to see the salary of their employees. So we need to tell OPA about this new information. And you can imagine this information being stored on an LDAP server. And you can have your bundle server provide this information to OPA. Or you can encode this information inside a JWT token and provide this to OPA as an input. So there are multiple ways you can do this. But for the purpose of this example, I'm going to hard code this information in the policy itself. So I have managers. So let's say Bob's manager is Alice and Fred. And let's say Alice's manager is Fred. So I have some kind of a hierarchy here. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to simply extend my rule to make use of this new information. And so now my user can be a manager of the person they are uh, managing. So if I say managers employee ID and the score. And so now if I have typed correctly, Again, I ask the question, can Alice, who's Bob's manager, access Bob's salary? And so now, if I evaluate this rule, allow should be true. So Alice, who's Bob's manager, can now see Bob's salary. And so one of the cool things about the playground is that you can simply select like a simple rule and have that evaluated. Oops. That's it. So that's true. So what we've done is we've taken that policy in English, which said that a user can see his own salary. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and a manager can see a user's salary. And we've converted that to the simple uh, policy in Rego. So this was our first Rego policy, right? So it's, it's, it's something. It's, it's our first policy that we've written. So now let's share this policy with the whole world. And so now you can simply press the share button and you'll get this link which will allow you to share your policy with your friends, family, and the whole world. So you copy the link and you close this. But before you share the link, let's see what's in the link. So you get your policy which you wrote, which is what you expect, and that's good. But there's more. If you click on the input, you also get the input that you had provided to the policy. And so again, if I evaluate this, I should get the answer true. And so I hope you guys start using the Rego Playground for writing policies, experimenting with Rego, and share the policies with the whole world. So let's look at some of OPA's use cases. So like I mentioned before, OPA is a general purpose policy engine. You can use it with all of these things and much more. And you can start using any of these integrations out of the box without having to write a single line of code. So today, we are going to focus on the admission control use case. So what is an admission controller? Right, so the admission controller basically is a piece of code that intercepts a request to the Kubernetes API server before that request gets persisted to etcd. And so you can use admission control to enhance the security profile of your Kubernetes cluster. And so with OPA as an admission controller, you can have many of these policies. For example, pull images only from private registries, or you want your containers to have resource limits. And you can do a bunch of other things with admission control and OPA. And so for example, so whenever you create a pod or whenever like an event happens, OPA gets called, a post call is made to OPA, and the request that goes to OPA has something like this as an input. So it's a deeply nested YAML structure, and OPA is supposed to make a decision looking at this and the policies and the data it has, make a decision, send it back to the service. So again, the common theme is that we are trying to decouple this policy enforcement from the decision making. And so now let's see how this actually works in action. Okay, 
So the policy we are going to demo says that two ingresses in different namespaces must not have the same host name. An ingress basically is an object in Kubernetes which controls external access to your services. And so we are going to enforce this policy which says that you cannot have two ingresses with the same host name in two different namespaces. So the first step of the demo is to take our demo app and deploy it in a prod namespace. And so our demo app is going to create an ingress object which basically says something like, if an incoming request comes for huli.com for a path slash, forward it to the product page service of my demo app. In step two of the demo, we will deploy Alice's version of her demo app in her dev namespace. And even this app, it defines an ingress resource which says that if any incoming request comes in for slash, send it to Alice's development app. So you can see that if I deploy Alice's app, it's going to have some unintended consequences. And it, it, you can imagine a scenario wherein an incoming request now gets sent to your test or development app without you even knowing about it. And worse, if somebody malicious is in control of this particular app, they have now access to the whole live sensitive production data, and they can just create havoc with this particular application. So clearly, we do not want this to happen, and this is something that we need to avoid at any cost. So the question now is, who is going to stop this from happening? So let's see the demo for that. Uh, so to make this demo a bit interactive so that you guys can try it out later, I'm going to run this demo on Catacoda, which is like an interactive training platform. So I'm going to start the demo. So like I said, we are going to create a prod namespace and deploy our app in that namespace. And we make sure all the pods are running. And once all the pods are running, we are going to go to the landing page of our demo application. So this is the landing page of our demo app. We see Bob. And we basically see Bob's employee details. We see his um, performance reviews and so on. And so now, in the step two of the demo, I'm going to deploy Alice's <laughs> version of the app in her dev namespace. Create the namespace, deploy the app, and make sure all the pods are running. And now, hopefully, I still see Bob. Well, that's not Bob. So something bad has really happened. Something disastrous has happened. We don't know why it's happened, but something really bad has happened. And we need to stop this at all costs and never let this happen again. So again, I ask the question, who is going to stop this from happening? Right answer. And so we have OPA to the rescue. So what you're going to do now is you're going to deploy OPA as an admission controller. And you're going to enforce a policy which says that two ingresses in different namespaces cannot share a host name. And hopefully, if everything goes well, OPA is going to prevent the app from being deployed. So now if I go and deploy Alice's app again, I get an error from OPA saying that there is a conflict with a host name in a different namespace, which means I'm not going to allow this ingress from being deployed. So basically, the OPA policy has kicked in. It has seen that an ingress is being created, and there's a violation, and it stopped it from happening. So now, if I refresh this page, we go back to Bob, which means everything is good. OPA has done its job. It has saved the world. You guys can go home easy today, sleep fine knowing that OPA is deployed somewhere as an admission controller. So this is how you would deploy OPA or use OPA as an admission controller in Kubernetes to have enforce custom policies without having to change or without having to redeploy any of the Kubernetes components. And so this was the open policy agent, which is an open source general purpose policy engine, which tries to decouple policy enforcement from decision making. Please check out the project at openpolicyagent.org, where you'll also find the link to the playground. You can join us on Slack for questions and use cases or discussions. 
and please visit the project on GitHub for real this time. And if you like what you see, please start the project. Thank you.